do you remember? I, I think probably you were about six months old. I, I'm, I'm sure you can remember this because you were on a beautiful blanket. I think your aunt gave it to your mom. I don't know, maybe your grandmother. I think maybe you can remember because actually you can probably remember the feel of the blanket because you weren't wearing anything. You know, they would put you down on your tummy and it was very soft. I hope you can remember because you'd be down there and you could hear their voices behind you. They were so excited and you were just feeling the blanket and then somewhere around Mm, for some of you, four months. For some of you, eight months. That's the beautiful thing about our bodies. Each one in its own time. Each one in its own way. You started to do this amazing thing. You started to push. Remember? You pushed. And it meant that your torso could come up like this. It was really incredible. The voices got very excited behind you. It was really great. They really loved what you were doing. Now, I'm not sure. For me, I think it was at about five months, but I figured out that I could actually lift one arm up and keep the other arm down. This was an amazing day. And you too, you did it. And we all spent, I don't know, weeks. We were just messing around with one arm. We were busy exploring. We tried all kinds of stuff with that one arm. And everybody around us was so amazed. Nobody rushed us. Nobody said, oh, you're so stupid, put that arm back down. <laughs> it was beautiful to watch. And then I think maybe it's because the voices were getting so excited. I'm not sure. But you reached up so far that you flipped over. It's a big change. The whole world changed because you took half a turn. And suddenly, you could see all the voices. <clears throat> it's amazing to me that that's all it takes is half a turn. And the whole world will change. It doesn't take very much. But you need your bodies to do it. And I can't imagine why we would want to live in a world where our bodies weren't our partners. Our bodies do so much for us. And they have the capacity to do so much more if we understood and were willing to consider the ways in which we can connect and disconnect from them. My own sense is that the world is so sick that if we don't use every single thing at our disposal, we won't be able to survive. And yet, we don't understand, relegate to some small little corner of the world what might be possible. So come with me. I'll tell you just a few stories of my own encounters with what it has been like. Because at the dance exchange, for uh, uh, too long to get into now, we have and have always had an equal commitment to the best concert work you can see, the most beautiful concert dancing, and a commitment to community life and the role of the arts and what artists have to be doing in the world. It isn't enough for me to just stay in my studio and do my work. It's just not enough. It won't work. So here are a few stories. When uh, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, my rabbi came to me and said, Liz, would, would, would you come and just spend a few evenings with us at the synagogue? I, I want to do some movement and some text study to understand how we Jews look at death. My rabbi was really upset. It took a lot for him to come to me, I think. But he knew enough to know that to heal his own self in this moment, he was going to need some extra help. So we did three sessions, and one, one night, on, I had, I was all adults, and one night we were um, looking at just one prayer. It's actually a prayer about death that you only read at Yom Kippur. So for those of you two days ago, you, you ran through it. It's a beautiful prayer. Uh, it, um, 
uh, in which God is pictured as having wings and human beings are pictured as being um, protected under the wing. So I asked people in this group to each go around and just find one image in the prayer that they liked and then we were going to make a dance based on all the images that they proposed. And incidentally, when people talk about things that matter to them, they will generate lots of movement, as you did, Richard, as he asked me just, to, just before to come up. He said, so come, come show me, show me. And this amazing gesture started coming up. It's there in each one of us. So we went around the circle, and this one man, he happened to be head of the adult education division of, this, of the synagogue, and he was really embarrassed. He did not want to say it. You know, I tell people they're in charge of their bodies and they're in charge of their images and they never have to share, but sometimes no is not no. Sometimes no is please ask me again, which I did. And he then said that his mother had knit him a sweater when he was five years old. And for some reason, he saw God's arms in the sweater. Now, I think that's just the most beautiful, incredible way to see the prayer. Why wouldn't it be wonderful if it was always like that when you're praying or in the middle of things that you do by road over and over and over again? But what did it take for his imagination to flash and how can we then partner these imaginations? So I think one thing that art does is spark the imagination, but the second thing and maybe the more important thing is artistic process helps us understand how to partner our imagination. Because a lot of times we're afraid of it, we're embarrassed about it, we don't want to think about what comes up, we, it's unbidden. What are we going to do with it and how do we handle it? And that is something that um, I think artistic process can aid us in, as we did in the synagogue that night. The Dance Exchange, we have four questions. Every project we take on looks somehow at these four questions. Who gets to dance? Where is the dancing happening? Where, where is it happening? What is the dancing about? And why does it matter? I think the four questions are good for most professions, actually. But let me tell you quickly, um, and I forgot to see, how much time do I have, Melissa? Or, great, OK. So I'm going to just tell you a quick little few stories from each of those questions and see how this relates to you. And perhaps, uh, it, to me, there's thousands of ideas in there about uh, innovation. I, I hope you'll hear them, even though I know I'm just talking about dancing. <clears throat> um, I was trained as a classical dancer. In fact, I performed for President Kennedy when I was 14 as one of a ballerina in this little troupe. Um, but, when my, uh, but eventually I left classicism, which is in a story in itself, and was turning to modern dance. And my mother got um, uh, diagnosed with a virulent form of cancer. She was given a very short amount of time to live. Luckily, I was able to go home and be with her in these last few months of her life. And she did things that people do who know they're dying, if you're lucky enough to know that. She imagined many, many people in her life that she wanted to see again. And I imagined them all as old. I guess our theme in this session has something to do with age, because um, <clears throat> when she died, I went back to Washington where I was living, and I wanted to make a piece about what my family had gone through, and I wanted to have old people be in the dance. Now, <clears throat> this is 1975, and I like to remind people that in 1975, this is pre-jogging. <laughs> it's amazing what has changed in the United States in the last 30 years. We are used to you know, practically naked people stretching on the streets, not against light posts anymore, but LEDs. But anyway, they're out there. <laughs> At the time, you didn't see that, and you certainly didn't see old people, because Robert Butler had just written his book, Why Survive? In 19, and it was just the beginning, beginning of the idea that there could be some kind of conscious aging. Anyway, I found this old home near my house eventually, because I didn't even know where they were, but I did find one. I asked the lady, could I come in and teach a dance class? She thought I was absolutely ridiculous. But see, I was desperate. And that, to me, is the thing about innovation. I was desperate. It's not like I wanted to break the rule that, you know, there should be old people on stage. I, you know, I was following the rules. I was only in my 20s. I thought that was getting old for my profession. Talked to, she said, however, she'd lost her entertainment. She needed something on Thursday nights. I could come in for $5 a week and do whatever I wanted. <laughs> and the first night I went, and it's not unlike this, they, except that the, I mean, they were seated like you guys are, but the room was also the room where the bingo was. They ate. I mean, it was just one of these very um, working class places uh, where people were trying to stay out of nursing homes. 
And I, I promised them I would perform a little. I performed a little bit. Then I said, OK, now it's your turn. We're going to exercise together. I said, everybody, I want you to turn your head like this. And of course, nobody moved. <laughs> I thought they couldn't hear me. <laughs> and I think it's interesting to think about that, because if you, if you are not in relationship with people, all you can believe are the stereotypes, right? That's all you know. So I yelled, OK, everybody, turn your head. You know, and again, nobody moved. So I began to run back and forth in front of them. And their heads went like this. <laughs> and I have to say, and it's the reason I tell this story over and over, it changed my life. I knew in that minute that everything I had ever known about dance, which I started when I was, was going to be challenged by being in this environment, and that the world was going to open up for me in ways I could not imagine. And that is exactly what happened. The old people became my teachers. They continued to perform after we made the piece about my mother's death. They were um, angels welcoming her to where she was next. They were incredible. Uh, I thought the show was over. They said, you know, we need to rehearse more. That's what I mean. They were my teachers. <clears throat> I learned very, very much from them. Since then, if you see a dance exchange performance, you always see old people. Right now, the company ranges from 20s into their 70s. We have a very, very busy, busy, busy touring schedule, and the seniors are amazing. And it's incredible to me that audiences are still so moved simply by seeing the old guys on stage. One is a man who had been in the military, retired at 53, never danced. Now he's in his 70s. Martha Graham says it takes 10 years to become a dancer. He has. And uh, I think people will retire and become artists. I think that is one of our features. So who gets to dance? Where is it happening? We take dance many, many places. Um, here's one little brief one. I, I was able to be an artist in residence for five years at Children's Hospital in Washington, DC. Um, I stopped going actually after my daughter was born. But up to that point, it was one of the most beautiful and intense. I used to, uh, a piano player and I, he'd wheel the piano. I'd, uh, but we did dances with nurses, with kids, with doctors, with families. It was amazing for people to be dancing with bodies that were ill, to have a moment when their body wasn't sick. And the, I learned so much. And th this is a key thing. Don't be sitting there thinking, oh, she's good. That's such nice charitable work. Yes, it is good for the people I dance with, but it is far better for me and for my profession. It is my profession. I heard somebody once say that um, idolatry is when you honor the part more than the whole. My profession honors technique and makes it a master. And in so doing, has lost some of the most beautiful, beautiful aspects of what dance can be. But as soon as you put old people on stage, you have to say, well, it can't be about the technique, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's got to be about something else, because their legs aren't going to go this hard, and they're not going to do five turns. It's just not going to be that. Well, <clears throat> at the hospital, I was getting this lesson again and again. I learned so much about choreography from these kids, because I had to make dances out of just faces or hands or whatever. But we, we finally came, we did one performance where the whole company came to the hospital and performed in the atrium, and they brought all the kids out, and everybody was there. And it was a piece I had made about bonsai trees which we have many in the, at the Arboretum in Washington, and um, a very quiet meditative piece. And this young child in the, uh, f in the first row fell asleep. I was very sad, because I liked this kid. I'd seen her earlier in the week. And as I was leaving the hospital, this nurse came running up to me, and she said, um, thank you so much. We've been trying to get that child to go to sleep for three days. <laughs> Now, I thought my job was to wake people up. That's the myth that I'd been trained. That's the paradigm. That's the, you name it. That's the idea for arts, right? Wake everybody up. And it turns out sometimes you need to put people to sleep. And so one of the things we discovered is that by putting ourselves in unlikely situations, we discovered incredible new value, use, and meaning in our art. I see my light is on, so I'm going to, we did, we did who and we did where what. I'm working on a piece right now. Two pieces are touring. One, a commission from the Harvard Law School uh, in honor of the Nuremberg Trials, which is a piece about human rights law. The second is a piece about genetics. And um, <clears throat> in so doing, I've been interviewing scientists around the country. They're in the piece via uh, incredible video. It's been a thrilling, thrilling project for, for all of us. Very, very physical. But I'd like to leave you with this one story from one scientist. I was at Princeton talking with uh, Bonnie Bassler, who's in the piece and is 
just an amazing biologist, but she wanted me to meet her mentor, who's a Nobel laureate. And I went to see him. <clears throat> I was working on a section of the dance that starts with, how do I ask myself a question? And then what happens in the dance is the scientists are talking about being in the lab and making mistakes, but the dancers on the tape are also talking about making mistakes in rehearsal and what happens and how that interacts. And in the end, you get to a theory. It happens to be a scientist who says, biology without evolution is like a character without a plot. So I was working on this section, and I asked this guy, so how do you ask yourself a question? And he said, I am fueled by my ignorance. I just love that. I'm fueled by my ignorance. So am I. I make things so I can understand things. I hope I ask myself a good enough question that I throw myself into free fall. And then I count on the methods that I've developed over the years to support my fall. But if I'm lucky enough, I'm going to find something new. But I thought to myself, what would the world be like if this man, this Nobel laureate, was on the Sunday talk show programs? instead of all those talking heads we get. And if we thought about ignorance from his perspective instead of the one that the American people are being given, what would happen? We don't have to be terrified, humiliated by our ignorance. We can be fueled by it. And I think ultimately that's the link that the arts can, I hope, artists working the way I am, and there are many of us, can do, which is to make a place for these conversations to happen because all of this innovative work here is going to displace people. It's going to displace people. And what are they going to do? How are they going to handle their imaginations? How are they going to wonder? It's beautiful that this person who can't move has a way to move, but now we have to reclassify what the body is. Pluto is nothing compared to what we are going to be reclassifying. And I think the arts are the partner. Thanks. Thank